At the height of World War I, as America was fighting a war promoted as safeguarding democracy, a man was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison for simply giving a speech. For criticizing the war, he was breaking the law, too, actually, and sent to jail. And as the nation was sending millions of young men to fight and die for freedom overseas, it was also sending some men and women behind bars for exercising basic democratic rights that America was founded upon. But just what propelled the progressive and idealistic Wilson administration to repress dissent so fiercely? Well, that's the treasure we're out to discover. I'm Dan Luer, and this is History for Humans. Eugene Debs, the man arrested for delivering that anti-war speech, was born in a small town in Indiana in the year 1855. At the age of 14, he left school to work in a train factory for 50 cents a day. He quickly radicalized and began fighting for the working men across the country against what he felt was the cold injustice of the capitalist system. He became active in organized labor and was an editor for a union publication. In 1893, he became president of the American Railway Union and helped organize some of the nation's biggest strikes during the Gilded Age. And he was first arrested for his work organizing the Pullman strike. And when he was in prison, he read a lot of the teachings of Karl Marx and declared himself a socialist in 1897. Out of prison, he helped to found the Socialist Party of America and ran for president three times before America entered the Great War. And it will be the war and the hypocrisy that he found in it that our story is focused on. But lest we go any further, our exploration question for today's story lecture is, why did the Wilson administration restrict civil liberties? And what made Debs still speak out against the war? So see where the details of the story fit into that frame. But umbrellas out, because I got some history to rain upon you first. So in late 1917, America declared war, and though the country had been divided previously, patriotism soared with enthusiastic excitement for war. You see, war tends to rally folks around the flag. But remember, Wilson was elected under the slogan, he kept us out of war. So there were still Americans who continued to feel that this was not America's fight. So as the Wilson administration mobilized the military for war overseas, getting our troops ready and trained and ready to fight, they also mobilized a home front campaign designed to build support for the war effort. George Neal headed the Committee of Public Information and hired many former progressive muckrakers to persuade all the American people to support the war as a patriotic necessity. The committee used propaganda to demonize the Germans, highlighting the threats they posed, and used figures like good old Uncle Sam and this classic poster to get Americans to join the military, serve food, grow victory gardens, and even to support limitations on their freedoms to help with the war. And these were just some of the ways that Americans' lives back home were devoted to the war effort. And the Committee of Public Information also needed to sell this war as not just a means to protect America from German aggression, but as a war to fight for American principles and its high ideals, to give Americans something to fight for and to really rally behind. The two slogans were as American as apple pie and potato guns, to make the world safe for democracy, and a war to end all wars. And in his speech to Congress about the need to protect human rights and democratic principles in the world, he also ironically promised to deal with disloyalty with a firm hand of stern repression, a promise he certainly made good on. Congress responded by passing the Espionage and Sedition Acts, which made it illegal to interfere with the draft, the selling of war bonds, criticizing the government or the war, and it was enforced with fines up to $10,000 and 20 years in jail. And that brings us to Dad Jokes in History! Why did Wilson support arresting anyone who was just criticizing the war? Let's hear it. Because he was trying to make the world safe for hypocrisy. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get political there, but if you think that you got a better one, I'd like to see it below. So the passing of the Sedition and Espionage Acts so sickened Debs that he went on a mission to challenge them, defend his rights, and dare the government to come after him. 
Eugene Debs was against the war from the very beginning. As a socialist, he believed that the European imperial powers were fighting this war for a simple reason, to further enrich the capitalist elite class and use the working class as fodder to die at their command. And he did not buy in to Wilson's slogans, believing America too was just out to protect their business interests. And for their criticism, socialist papers around the country were shut down. Many leading socialists were arrested for protesting the war, including his close friend and leading feminist Kate O'Hare, who was sentenced to five years for an anti-war speech. With so many of his peers behind bars, Debs began to feel guilty being free, with all those who were standing up for their rights being sent to prison. So Debs went on a speaking tour across the Midwest to rally opposition just as American troops were being sent to fight in their first battles and when most Americans were rallying to support those troops. He didn't mind the controversy and he had always been a fiery speaker. He could mesmerize a crowd with his words, passion, and message. So when he came to Canton, Ohio on June 16, 1918 and spoke, he aimed to convince Americans of the need to bring those troops home and to encourage others to resist the draft. It was a sultry summer day. Still, Debs wore his classic heavy tweed jacket, buttoned up vest and sweat pouring off his massive forehead. He rose to the bandstand in front of the crowd of over a thousand people who were leaning in to hear his words. Amongst the crowd, federal agents circled, and a stenographer working for prosecutors began furiously typing, capturing Debs' every word as he fired off against the war. Dropping straight hammers from the podium like, Wars throughout history have been waged for conquest and plunder. They have always taught and trained you to believe it to be your patriotic duty to go to war and to have yourself slaughtered at their command. But in all the history of all the world, you, the people, have never had a voice in declaring war. And strange as it certainly appears, no war by any nation in any age has ever been declared by the people. Yours not to reason why, yours but to do and die. The stenographer could barely believe how subversive his words were, especially with agents at hand. In his speech, he also challenged the view that those protesting the war were unpatriotic and traitors. To him, the real traitors were those sending the men to die, hiding behind the flag, but really had their eyes gleaming for golden glory. In his two-hour-long speech, he also spent much of the time promoting socialism and praising the Bolshevik revolution in Russia, led by Lenin as the first real democracy. Now, this too smacked of irony and hypocrisy even more than President Wilson's because at that time Lenin was carrying out a terror campaign of mass murder of his political enemies, not simply limiting some of their speech or throwing them in jail. And that should show you how complicated the figures of history are and probably how complicated we ourselves are, right? And as Debs wrapped up his speech, federal agents eyed him closely as he backed away from the podium. The crowd dispersed, and then so did Debs. He left that day a free man, but would not remain so for long. Unsurprisingly, the Espionage and Sedition Acts were challenged in the courts. Could it really be constitutional to make it a crime to simply speak and to protest? Things specifically protected in the First Amendment? I mean, it's the first one. Not like the seventh, whatever that one is about. Oh, it's something about the rights of people in court. Boring! But three different times, the Supreme Court upheld these restrictions on free speech during wartime. In Schenck vs. the United States, Justice Oliver Holmes famously cited restrictions could be made on speech when they're is a clear and present danger of that speech, like shouting fire in a crowded theater. Basically, they argued that speech that was critical of the war could put our country in danger, since it could undermine our efforts in winning this most dreadful and horrific war. Now, did speaking out against it and of the drafting of young men put the nation in real danger? I don't know, but as far as the Supreme Court saw it, it did. But to Debs and other dissenters, the war was the real danger, not those fighting against it. It was two weeks after his Canton, Ohio speech when Debs was finally arrested by federal agents. He was charged with 10 accounts of violating the Espionage and Sedition Acts. Debs was heading to trial and it made national news for those who despised and loved him. Once in cuffs, Debs stated, I thank the capitalist masters for putting me here. They know where I belong under their criminal and corrupting system. It is the only compliment they could pay me. He was already embracing the role as the martyr. And in court, prosecutors argued that he was encouraging protests and obstructing the draft, which is putting it pretty mildly. Debs was found guilty on three accounts and sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. 
His imprisonment was cheered by the press and much of the public, but it only seemed to increase his popularity across the country. He would run again for president on the socialist ticket in the 1920 election as convict number 9652 and got nearly 1 million votes. But after serving two and a half years of his term, the new Republican president, Harding, commuted his sentence and even invited him to the White House. And Debs continued fighting for the working men and women of the country, and his dream of a socialist utopia would not play out the way he imagined it in the decades after his death in 1926. Even though the war ended in 1918, the Sedition Act was not repealed until the last days of the Wilson administration, while components of the Espionage Act remain in law today. And the ideas surrounding Deb's speech continue to be debated in the country and represent the line between our freedoms, our national security, and governmental power. For me, I'm grateful for the sacrifices of the soldiers and for those who fought for their rights guaranteed in the Constitution, even when it meant jail. And it's going to be your job as a citizen to consider if you think that Debs was right to speak out or if the government was justified in limiting some of our freedoms during war. Because I promise you, it's a question that we are going to continue to wrestle with in this country for a long while. So thanks for engaging in some history today. This has been History for Humans. And hey, if you like this episode, could you do a small act of charity and just click and show it? It's like right there. If it's awkward, I'll look away when you do it. Thanks. And for teachers and homeschool parents, there are lessons and resources that go with all of my episodes on my website, historyforhumans.com. That's historyforhumans.com. Because if you're doing a learning activity that you can find there, hang out because we got instructions in just a sec. All right, guys, get ready to stretch because you're going to be dealing with some heavy history in today's lesson. We're going to be reading four primary sources all related to World War I and the limiting of free speech. But instead of focusing on Deb since the episode was about him, you're going to be learning about another protester, Emma Goldman, and how she was arrested for violating the Espionage Act. So you're going to read each of the documents carefully and closely, answer the questions next to it, and then this is going to get you to part two where you gather evidence between the documents that show that Emma Goldman was actually putting the nation at risk. And then the other side, evidence that just shows that Emma Goldman was exercising her free speech and should be set free. And lastly, you're going to have to make a decision. Do you think that Emma Goldman was putting the nation at risk with her speech? And this should lead to a great debate, first in here as you wrestle with the decision and how you feel about it, and then in the class with your peers. So I hope you enjoy it, take it seriously, and I'll see you next time.